Thank you, and um, I think I, we were all kind of given our topics, and uh, we got, I got the most exciting one because um, with my presentation, we can look at where we are presently and dream a little bit about where the future might go. So um, one of the great things about this session is where we have already come because I think 10 years ago, we were just moving some of the mathematical modeling into the field and some of the nice conversations that you can have with Kevin Hall offline um, will tell you about the challenges of bringing some new, new ideas into uh, and integrating disciplines. It's not, it's not easy. So it's wonderful to have a session like this one where we're seeing the utility of predictive modeling and actually seeing it integrated. So my disclosure statement is the following, which you have access to. So as uh, David uh, started out, um, he described many different modeling methods that are out there. And you might be overwhelmed seeing all these methods here at once. Um, but as Jim Hill uh, mentioned in his presentation, not right before ours, uh, we are very collaborative and we enjoy being called upon to work with you. So uh, if you have a modeling project or have ideas of where modeling may be used, just you know, drop us a line and we're willing to work with you and, and discuss many of the different ways that you, uh, different approaches that are out there. Um, here in the session you saw where predictive models can be used to ask what if questions. And in Kevin's talk you saw how the results can form the basis of targeted experiments. Not only that, um, one of the things Kevin mentioned is that um, he had designed, uh, he had modeled first and he had seen the predictive outcome. And when they actually saw the predictive outcome justified experimentally, it lends more rigor to that experiment. Um, and you can kind of, you felt that when you heard him speak on that topic. It can also be used, as Corby Martin pointed out, um, when there's deviations from expected, from a validated model, um, we can now use that deviation to give that as feedback back to the individual patient and use that feedback to promote behavior change. As Corby Martin pointed out, uh, objective feedback uh, that's rigorous um, and frequent is one of the proponents of behavior modification. So um, we can see how predictive models are used in this, in, uh, in this way as well. In Ben's talk, we heard about how uh, personalizing the treatment um, can really be effective um, in providing individual treatment recommendations. The 3,500 uh, calorie rule got some beating up in this session, um, but 3,500 is a not per, unpersonalized or depersonalized treatment recommendation in some sense. Everybody gets the same treatment recommendation, whether you're male or female, whether you're young or experienced. <laughs> um, so in that way, uh, we're moving away from just giving uh, a one-size-fits-all treatment recommendation to something that involves more of the patient characteristics. And as Cor uh, Corby pointed out, that brings a more collaborative component to counseling. And Emily's talk really talked about the potential impact of public policy and the public compensation in response to that public policy intervention. Uh, in addition to that, I think uh, uh, Emily alluded to this, but at times there are unintended consequences of a public policy. I know several of us in this room have looked at that, um, and there's uh, literature out there on the unintended consequences. I'm kind of making something up, but if you, you maybe tax sugar-sweetened beverages, Maybe someone's going to buy their own iced tea and put more sugar into that iced tea. So that was an unintended consequence uh, of a public policy. And so um, mathematical models on a, uh, can explore this beforehand, before implementation of the public policy, to maybe reveal some of those unintended consequences. David also mentioned uh, that uh, predictive models can provide us better understanding. Um, for example, the obesity prevalence plateau that we see, some laud it as the plateau that we see is a consequence of better education that the public knows uh, through better interventions and prevention programs, um, we are able to mitigate the effects of obesity. 
However, the dynamic models, one of the commonalities they have um, is that they all predict a plateau as a natural flow without an intervention involved. So this begs the question of whether this is just the natural course of things and not a result of obesity interventions. So here's the exciting part. Where, where do we think we can go next? Um, I love thinking about this. Um, well, how about using mathematical models in the way that Kevin Hall has mentioned in his talk uh, on a large scale to develop a community-wide intervention? I'm going to give you a, a, little exam a few examples. These aren't fantasies, actually. These are, uh, there's actually pilot data that's out there that uh, actually provides some evidence and support that this may work. There's vast amounts of data out there. <laughs> Um, that's being collected through electronic medical health records and all sorts of avenues. So um, accessing that data and using, for example, machine learning um, can guide our treatment, prevention and treatment programs. And that's pretty exciting. I, I've really been uh, blessed to see some of the exciting work that's going on now that's harnessing this data to develop more targeted um, prevention and treatment programs. And finally, uh, one of the examples, which I'm unable, unable to really show you uh, this slide because I, I wasn't able to access it, but I have a few individuals I work with that work in the field of medicine and are looking at mathematical modeling uh, as a way to um, change treatment. So one of the examples um, that I saw that was really interesting was treatment of um, colon cancer. So colon cancer is diagnosed usually via radiology reports. And those radiology reports are subjective. And they're not objectives. And so you can get several radiologists coming up with different identifications of the tumor from the, from the ultrasound scan that they're um, obtaining, or the CAT scan they're obtaining. This in, and this involves just a scan. If the radiologist determines the tumor has spread too far, they have to cut the tissue and remove the tumor. And this involves the individual um, having to wear a bag. Now that might be fine maybe if you're older. I, I disagree. <laughs> As I'm getting older, I disagree. But if you're in your 40s and you get this, um, get this diagnosis, you'll be wearing a bag for the rest of your life. And um, if that diagnosis was incorrect, which it has a high rate of uh, being incorrect, um, this is awful. And so what this uh, individual, Satisha, um, uh, who's working at Case Western right now on MRIs is looking at is using mathematical models and pattern analysis to look at these different um, radiology reports and determine mathematically what the spread of the tumor is. So it's a more objective and rigorous way to identify where the tumor is and um, avoid the use of the bag. So it's, a, it's a really amazing where this is going. So I wanted to show you a little bit about these dreams. Um, this is a uh, network science wasn't talked about here, and this is uh, actually one of, actually it was talked about in David's talk. Um, Christakis and Fowler had kind of started the idea of network science being applied to obesity. Um, this is a slide from Captain Ryan Miller in my department at the United States Military Ac Academy on his research. And what you're looking at, you don't have to really understand what's on the slide except maybe the colors. You're looking at uh, a terrorist network where the information was not complete. So we call this a dark network. And he was trying to identify sub-communities in the network. And um, in these sub-communities, uh, this is past data, and he was able to identify these sub-communities in the data, and that's what you're seeing in the color codes. Um, how would we apply this to oh no, a community-wide uh, obesity intervention? This is another slide I love by Major Dan Coban. Identifying who's the most important individual in the network is critical. Right? That, this might be how you want to deliver your intervention through this person. So you're looking at data from the United States Military Academy um, and something unusual that we have where students have to document where they got help from in, uh, in their projects. So it's documented and we load it up into Major Dan Coban's model and the colors that you're looking at are the communities. Now you would think that, that the United States Military Academy General Robert Caslin is maybe the most important person on post. Um, in fact, that green dot that you're looking at is probably the most important person in the freshman class. And this is um, poor little Cadet Potter, um, who, who has a mission that he's going to help every single freshman um, succeed. And everyone comes to Cadet Potter for help. And if I was going to design an intervention, 
I would want to have Cadet Potter involved. And so this is something that network science can give us that we can uh, modify for a community-wide uh, intervention uh, in, obesity, uh, in obesity research. One last exciting thing, I, I love these new uh, technologies that are um, being um, identified. This is a 3D body scanner. And the 3D body scanner has a volume of data. Remember Be Beverly Crusher using the transponder and telling us, uh, giving us an assessment of our health in Star Trek? Well, imagine if someone walks into a doctor's office and they're not weighed, but they're just scanned, and you see the information on this scan, like circumferences, all kinds of information is gathered from the scan within 20 seconds. So this kind of scan already exists, and we can imagine it uh, being part of the clinic not too far in the future. Um, I did mention electronic health records, and I will close with a quote from one of my favorite mathematicians, Paul Erdős. If numbers aren't beautiful, I don't know what is. And that's a quote from a mathematician, and I'm trained as a mathematician. So, thank you. <laughs>